That's a huge problem because your opportunity costs for trying that lesser supported treatment is so much higher than in this treatment mistakes video, we'll reveal why it's so important to consider how fast your hair loss is progressing before jumping into any treatment. On average, people with pattern hair loss lose about 5% hair volume every year. This isn't a lot, and since hair loss is often such a slow process to begin with, we can fall victim to something known as change blindness. We're incapable of noticing minute month-to-month -month changes to our hair, so we tend to only notice hair loss after maybe 30% or more of our hair volume is gone. But that 5% yearly hair loss rate, that's just an average. It's actually the midpoint on a bell curve. On the one side, people are losing hair at 1% hair volume every year. That's barely noticeable. On the other side, they're losing hair at a rate of 30% or more. That is noticeable, and it's why some people take 40 plus years to go bald while others can have it happen to them in just five to 10 years. Now. Think of this and then think of all of the product advertisements you're bombarded with for hair growth on a weekly basis. You've got laser caps, pharmaceuticals, natural supplements, herbal topicals, microneedlers, experimental devices. Most of these products have some scientific support, often in the form of clinical studies. But not all scientific support is created equally. Some scientific support actually ranks a lot higher than others. For example, let's compare two hair loss interventions, saw palmetto versus finasteride. One is natural, the other is a drug, but both are believed to target the same thing, the hormone DHT, which is causally associated with male and female pattern hair loss. So let's start with saw palmetto. Over nine studies totaling 381 participants have shown that saw palmetto could improve androgenic alopecia. At face value, this sounds great, but when we look closer at the data, Many of these studies are what we would call lower quality. Most of them lacked a placebo group, some were funded by companies selling saw palmetto, and all of them had small sample sizes. So for each study, there's a higher risk of false positive results. That's a result that's due to statistical noise that might have washed out with a larger sample size. This type of problem happens all the time in research, which is why results replication is so important. A great example happened in the 1990s with saw palmetto itself, where very small studies, several of them, demonstrated that saw palmetto extract might help improve an enlarged prostate. These studies inspired better controlled, larger clinical trials with hundreds and hundreds of participants in which saw palmetto over longer periods showed little to no effect. Again, study quality, results replication, sample sizes, these things are all really, really important. Now let's compare the data on saw palmetto to the data on another hair loss intervention, finasteride. This is a drug that's been studied for 30 plus years in over 30,000 patients across hundreds of research groups with dozens of randomized placebo-controlled clinical trials, nearly all of which showed significant hair count and hair density increases for the people using the drug. That's a lot of evidence. I mean, if we combined every single study and every single participant together testing saw palmetto for hair loss, well, these don't even make up a quarter of the participants in this one study on finasteride. And that's just one of the hundreds of finasteride studies out there. These comparisons are meant to illustrate two concepts. The first is the hierarchy of evidence, which evaluates how well studies are designed. And the second is the totality of evidence, which evaluates how much research has actually been conducted on any one intervention. The higher the hierarchy of evidence and the totality of evidence, the more likely it is that study results actually reflect real world experiences for people trying those interventions. This is important because we can use the hierarchy and totality of evidence to rank how hair loss interventions might compare to one another. At the top of the list, we've got pharmaceutical options and toward the bottom of the list, we've got natural interventions. Now, natural interventions, they absolutely work for some people, but again, the hierarchy and the totality of evidence supporting those natural interventions, it's far more limited, which means that in real life, there will be higher variability in clinical results versus real world results. And here's how not understanding this can become a problem, especially when it comes to hair loss speeds. Say you're fighting hair loss and you're hit with an advertisement for a product that says, clinically proven to regrow hair. This might actually be true, but if that claim is based on one single study funded by the very company selling that product, 
then it's also true that the evidence supporting that product, it's not very robust and it's subject to bias. This means that that product and its efficacy, they rank lower on the hierarchy and the totality of evidence. And then if you're going to try it, the results from that one clinical study might actually not reflect your own experience using it. Knowing this, you might be able to see where I'm going with how these problems relate to the speed at which hair loss is progressing for you. Say you've had a receding hairline for the last few years, but maybe you don't shed a lot of hair every day, and maybe within three to five month windows, you don't really notice that your hair loss is cosmetically getting worse. That's all good because it suggests that you're losing hair more slowly on this side of the bell curve. So say that you try a product with less clinical support for a full year, say it doesn't work for you. Well, then you really just risked less than 5% loss in hair volume. That's not a lot, and you could probably afford to test that before moving on to better supported treatments if your preferences are to try that product first. But say that you're losing hair more rapidly, say that you notice a lot of shedding every day and that within three to five month windows, you consistently notice that your hair loss is visually worsening. That suggests that you're losing hair more rapidly. You're on this side of the bell curve, and if you try that same product for a full year and it doesn't work for you, you're not risking a 5% loss in hair volume. You're risking something like 10%, 20%, maybe even 30% of your remaining hair. That's a huge problem because your opportunity costs for trying that lesser supported treatment is so much higher than the other individual who's losing hair more slowly. So when you're thinking about treatments, please, please, please keep this in mind how fast you're losing hair. The slower it's progressing, the better candidate you are for more experimental, lesser supported interventions. Because you probably have more wiggle room to try those, and if you see success from them, great. But the faster your hair loss is progressing, the more you should probably consider the tried and true FDA approved options that rank higher on the hierarchy and the totality of evidence. Because those treatments will most likely put you in a far better position for success. Now, I'm also aware that Pharmaceutical companies are often in the best financial position to run robust, well-controlled clinical trials. This will obviously obfuscate the landscape of research. I also don't want to discount the fact that pharmaceutical companies have no vested interest in proving out the efficacy of natural remedies like green tea extract or saw palmetto simply because those substances are not patentable, so the companies cannot corner the market. On that basis alone, you can expect clinical support for natural products to almost always be far less robust. So let me make one thing clear. These evaluation tools, the hierarchy of evidence, the totality of evidence, they are far from perfect and they have a preferential bias toward pharmaceutical interventions simply because of the profit incentives built into our own healthcare system. At the same time, these systems are the best that we currently have. And while we have to make treatment decisions based on partial information, we also have to recognize that if there were a natural intervention that worked for every single person, we'd probably see strong anecdotal signals of that reflected online or in products by now. The long story short is that it's complicated and with that I will leave you with these final words. When fighting hair loss, time is always of the essence. The speed of your hair loss should always inform your candidacy for novel or experimental therapies. The slower your hair loss, the better position you are in to experiment. The faster your hair loss, the more aggressively hair loss should be treated. I hope this video helps and we'll have more coming soon.